All right, so let's have a look at reviewing the motion mini quiz. But to start with, we want the relationship between distance y and the time x for an object that's been falling. So the equation we're going to want is this one, half a t squared. Now, if it's falling from rest, we can get rid of this term, and then let's put the symbols that they're using. So y is equal to half a x squared. So what we can see from that is that y is directly proportional to x squared. So it's this one, option A. Okay, so let's continue and look next one. So in the table below, indicate which of the quantities are vectors on which are scalars. Uh, so velocity uh, has magnitude and direction, so it's a vector. Speed is just magnitude, distance is just magnitude, and displacement has magnitude and direction. So velocity and displacement are your vectors, speed and distance are your scalars. Okay, a tennis ball is thrown vertically downwards and bounces on the ground. The ball leaves the hand with an initial speed of 1.5 meters per second at a height of 0.6 meters, 5 meters above the ground. The ball rebounds is caught when traveling upwards with a speed of 1 meters per second. Assuming air resistance is negligible, show that the speed of the ball is about 4 meters per second just before it hits the ground. So let's have a look in the downward motion. We have s is 0.65 and it's downwards so it's going to be minus 0.65 u is uh, minus 1.5 because it's uh, downwards 1.5 v is what we're trying to find a is going to be minus 9.81 because it's accelerating downwards and t we haven't been given uh, so what we need is an equation linking v, u, s, and a. So that's going to be uh, this one right here. So we don't even need to rearrange it. All we need to do is square root the whole thing. And then just substitute in the values. 1.5 squared plus 2 times Sorry, it's minus 1.5 squared, 2 times minus 9.81 times minus 0.65. And when we put that into our calculator, we're going to get... And we're going to end up with two solutions to this because it's square root. But remember, it's downward, so it's going to be the minus solution. So it's going to be minus 3.9 meters per second to two significant figures there. And that would be your answer. So in terms of the marking points for this one, essentially, there's a mark for selecting the right CVAT equation. There's a mark for showing the numbers correctly substituted in and remembering your signs there. And then there's the final mark for giving minus 3.9 to two significant figures. Um, if at some point you said in the question, I'm going to treat the downward direction as negative, uh, sorry, as positive, you could end up with a plus solution, but using the methods we've looked at in class, you should end up with minus 3.9. And that's that one. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. All right, so this question wants us to sketch a velocity versus time graph. Uh, starting from the time, it's released, uh, it hits the ground at TA and is caught at time B. So I guess we can mark on some key points in here. So we know at time A it's going to be at minus 3.9. So we know it's going to go there. And we also know if we're ignoring air resistance that acceleration is constant of minus 9.8. So we know to draw a straight line graph here. Uh, mine's a bit wonky because I can't draw too well on, on my screen. So essentially that's the first section and the two marking points are first of all that you've drawn it between the two points and the second one that you've drawn a straight line recognizing acceleration is constant. The third marking point is for recognizing that for the second section it's going to be in the positive section because it's bouncing upwards but the gradient has to stay 
the same as before because it still has the same acceleration as before. So what we need to do is go and go backwards from y. Oh goodness me, that's terrible. Uh, that's the problem with touch screens. Okay, let's try that again. So essentially we want a line with the same gradient as before. And it should be a straight line, so it should end up about the three kind of value there. Um, so uh, first marking point, you've essentially got a line connecting these two points here. Second marking point is that your lines should be straight. Third is that the gradient of the two lines should be the same. Okay, so that's that one. So let's move on. Okay, so in a game of tennis, the ball is hit horizontally at a height of 1.2 metres and travels a horizontal distance of 0.5 metres before reaching the ground. Calculate the initial horizontal velocity given to the ball when it was hit. Okay, so the first key here is we've got a distance but to get velocities we're going to need to time. So what we're going to do is calculate the time it takes to fall 1.2 meters. Uh, so what we're going to do is use this equation right here. Squared. So we're looking in the vertical direction first to find the time. So we know this one. The vertical direction we know its initial speed is u. Final velocity we don't know. Acceleration is minus 9.81. And then time is what we're trying to find out. So we can already get rid of this term right here. So we know that t is going to be the square root of 2s over a. So it's going to be square root of 2 times by minus 1.2 divided by minus 9.81. So let's calculate that to start with. Which gives us a time of 0.49 blah 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 seconds. So we'll leave that unrounded because we're going to use that later on. Now the next key thing to realise is that during its flight there's going to be no acceleration in the horizontal direction. So the horizontal velocity is going to stay the same throughout because gravity is only acting downwards and during its flight the tennis racket is no longer supplying a force in the horizontal direction. So that means we can just use this very simple equation, velocity is distance over time. And the reason we can use that is because velocity is going to stay the same the whole time. So it travels 5 metres in 0 0.49 seconds. And that's going to end up giving us a velocity of uh, 10 metres per second there. Okay, so in terms of the marking points for this question, uh, the first point was here, showing your numbers being substituted in to calculate t. Second marking point was this one, uh, calculating what the time was. Then the third one is using that time and the distance to calculate what velocity is there. Um, so that's how we deal with that. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. All right, so for this next question, we're gonna look at a Galilean thought experiment. Um, so this is gonna be done in the absence of air, so and the absence of friction, so there's no work done against any kind of resistance force here. So Galileo thought that under these circumstances, the ball would reach position C if released from rest at position A, because, and C is the same height above the ground as A. Um, so let's think about this in terms of uh, energy transfer. So to start with, we're starting with uh, some GP and when it reaches B, it's going to be converted into some uh, kinetic energy there. So here is a, a, here is a B and then going from B to C, uh, we're going to take that kinetic energy and we're going to turn that back into GP. So what we conclude from that is that GPE initial is going to be equal to the GPE final. 
and then thinking about how we can link in heights into here. So what that means is MGHI is equal to MGHF. And then we can cancel the MGs, giving you HI equals HF. Um, so those are the stages there. So this is a three mark question. So you do need to be detailed about this. So uh, the first mark would be for getting these overall energy transfers right. So you could have done this as one expression if you want to. And then the next marking point was then from that identifying you had this. And then the third mark is for taking those GPs and showing how they mean the heights would be the same, which is the last step here. Alrighty. So let's move on to the next. So then Galileo imagined his track changes to this one. So we've taken away the second half of the curve and the slope is now horizontal. So I want to sketch a speed versus time graph for the ball um, from its release at A until it reaches position X as shown and indicate on your graph the time when the ball is at B. Um, so the first key thing to recognize here is that actually this isn't a free fall scenario. So the acceleration isn't going to be a constant. So at least initially, it's not going to be a straight line type graph. OK, so um, we need to think about what the acceleration is going to be. So what we're going to need is at each moment in time, essentially, what is the component of acceleration parallel to the slope? So we can see that over time, the component of the weight force parallel to the slope is going to be getting smaller and smaller because the weight force is always in this direction, but it's at a bigger angle away from it. So its component is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until it reaches zero at B. There will be no force accelerating it once it gets to B. So the gradient of your graph should be essentially zero once you reach B. Uh, so let's mark on B first of all. So we know from B through to X, essentially what we're going to have, see if I can do this. From then on, it's just going to be a straight line graph. The acceleration is zero because there's no accelerating force at that point. And as we go down the slope, the acceleration is going to decrease over time. So the gradient should decrease over time. So essentially what we're going to get is a graph that looks like this. Um, so in terms of the marking points, the first one is for getting a graph with a decreasing gradient to start up to a maximum that you put B in the right place. So essentially you can see that once it goes past B, the gradient becomes zero. That's another one. And then for having a straight line graph from there on, because acceleration is zero, that would give you another one. OK, so then Newton later published his three laws of motion. Explain how Newton's first law of motion is illustrated by the motion of the ball between B and X. And I imagine a lot of people who did this question will have ignored this. So be very careful when you're reading the question. Um, so first of all, what is Newton's first law? Newton's first law. Uh, so essentially, to summarize it briefly, uh, you should explain it a little bit more fully than this. What am I saying constantly? Constant velocity unless force acts. Actually, I should put, let's put, let's be specific here. A resultant force acts. So Newton's first law says that velocity will main, remain the same or both speed and direction will remain the same unless a resultant force acts. So between B and X, uh, to explain how this graph shows, so between B and X, there's no resultant force because the motion is perpendicular to um, the weight force. 
force. So essentially what that means is V has to be constant during that section there. Okay, um, so that's sort of a link between Galileo and Newton. Um, so there, this question is worth two. So the first mark was for explaining what Newton's first law is, and the second for uh, explaining how the graph shows that. Um, um, but you need to be careful not to have done this the other way around um, and said, because velocity is constant, that means resultant force is constant. That's not the right way around. The key thing is to recognize during this section, resultant force is zero, which is why velocity has to remain the same. So you need it that way around. Okay, and that concludes this uh, video. I'm just going to quickly scroll through the mark schemes of these questions so you can see them for yourselves. Uh, just, I'm going to keep scrolling, so just pause them if you need them at any point.